Well, suffering has always been a major theme of our podcast with about 1,800 mentions of the word suffering alone. Just the word suffering, 1,800 mentions in our podcast history. You can find a digest of all the ways that this has been addressed in the Ask Pastor John book on pages 365 to 394. And we've recently concentrated our attention on this theme more than than normal, I would say. Suffering, as we saw, distinguishes true ministry from the prosperity gospel preachers. We saw that in ABJ 2087. Uh, Then we looked at how not to respond to suffering in ABJ 2094, looking at Job's wife. Uh, We looked at the pain of a woman who has been sorely mistreated and how she should respond in ABJ 2095. And last time we looked at how to press on in ministry even after God takes your beloved wife away. That was in APJ 2096. In this heavy season, a grieving dad writes in to ask us about his struggle with doubt in this anonymous email. Dear Pastor John, my wife and I are grateful for your ministry and for this podcast and for the impact you have had on our lives. In January of this year, my wife gave birth to our firstborn baby boy. He was beautiful. My heart grew 10 times. I've never seen my wife so happy. The Lord seemed to answer all of our prayers of anxiety and worry, general and specific, with a regularity which frankly stunned me. These seem to be gentle signs for my wife particularly of his tender care and goodness to us. I sense from this that despite our fears about pregnancy and the health of our baby, the Lord's hand was with us as I know it is. Two weeks later, we woke up and our baby had suffocated. I did CPR for 10 minutes as the paramedics arrived and took him. I prayed for God to make him breathe again. I prayed at the hospital for the same thing, but he was gone. A situation which seemed too good to be true so quickly turned into a situation which seemed too terrible to be real. Before this, I never processed deeply what happens when a child dies in infancy. Given our situation, I've thought about this a lot over the last several weeks, including APJ episodes in which you describe your reasoning through Romans 1. This and other resources and my own inferences from the Bible all seem to point in the same direction, that my son is in heaven. But critically listening to the reasoning of others, there seems to be either a best guess attitude or arguments that have to skip to the conclusion sooner or later in their logic for a lack of explicit biblical evidence on the topic. I find that I am 99% sure that my son is in heaven, but there's always the little last bit of questioning or doubt. This doubt holds me back from rejoicing in the safety and final security in life that my child has with the Lord. So my question is this, can I freely rejoice in the fact that my son is in heaven, or will this be something I cannot be completely sure of until I am with Jesus in heaven too? One of the reasons I want to address this question is because the essence of the issue being raised is much broader than the immediate question about how we can be sure if a deceased infant is in heaven. I don't want to minimize that question, and I realize it is the most urgent one being asked at this heartbreaking moment by this heartbroken dad. But I think the way the question is posed really does make the issue very broad and very urgent for all of us. I would call it the question of the final 1%. Mm. So this dad says that after all his biblical study, his thinking and praying, I find that I am 99% sure that my son is in heaven, but there is always that last little bit of questioning or doubt. This doubt holds me back from rejoicing in the safety and final security and life that my child has with the Lord. The final 1% prevents his joy. What is it that takes this dad all the way through 99% of certainty, but not the 1%? Here, here's some of the key words that he gives in answer to that question. Thought, reasoning from Romans 1, other resources, inferences from the Bible, critical listening, arguments, logic. In other words, 
his best efforts to use his God-given capacities for observation and analysis and reasoning and critical reflection and logic and argument and Bible, these are able to bring him, he says, to a 99% confidence, but there remains a voice in his mind that says, he could be wrong. Now, my point is that there is perhaps no doctrine, no truth claim for which the same thing could not be said. Does God exist? Is Christ divine? Was Jesus raised from the dead? Is the death of Jesus the action of God to forgive sins? Is there a heaven, a hell? Is the Bible inerrant? When our humblest, most fair-minded, most thorough, most diligent investigation of all the evidences is complete, it would be honest for most people to say, these efforts bring me to 80, 90, 99% certainty, but there remains in my mind a voice that says, it is possible you could be mistaken on all of that. And so the 1% gap remains the problem of the 1%. And I should make clear that the 1% gap exists for the atheist and the agnostic as well as the Christian. The assertion that there's no God, that Jesus Christ is not God, that the gospel of Jesus is not needed for salvation, that the Bible is not true, these assertions, when all is said and done, Leave a voice in your head, a gap, a voice saying, you may be wrong. So for the Christian, how does God close the 1%? Or does he? Some would quote Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight and conclude that faith leaps across the 1% without sight. I don't think that's what Paul meant. I don't think walk by faith, not sight, means walk by uncertainty, not certainty. In the New Testament, faith is not the opposite of knowing. It's the opposite of distrusting, rejecting, scorning. In 2 Corinthians 4.14, Paul says, We believe, and so we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up with Jesus. We believe, knowing. Knowing leads to belief. It's not that the absence of knowing requires you to blindly believe. That's just not the way the New Testament thinks about faith. When Paul was trying to awaken faith, he gave arguments and reasons and evidences And when he was arguing for the resurrection, he said, Then Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Meaning, you can go talk to them and increase your sense of evidential confidence by looking at evidences. The Bible intends for Christians to have assurance. Paul describes his ministry like this. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, that your hearts may reach the full assurance of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. He wants full assurance for his people. Hebrews 6, 11, we desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope to the end. 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Paul prays in Ephesians 1.18 that the eyes of our hearts be enlightened, that we may know what is the hope to which he has called us. So the question is, how does the Bible describe the closing of the 1%? It does not describe that closing as a leap in the dark. It does not describe it as a wager. 
It does not describe it as a crossing of our fingers for the last 1%. Instead, the New Testament describes the closing of the last 1% as the supernatural shining in our hearts of a divine spiritual light through the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It describes it as the witness of God's Spirit himself. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It describes it as a divine sealing by the Spirit, as a down payment of our inheritance, Ephesians 1.13. And it describes it as the love of God poured into our hearts by the Spirit, Romans 5.5. 5, Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So the point is not that every doctrinal question has the same level of importance or is granted the same fullness of assurance. The point is that God wants his children to be fully assured that he's real, Christ is real, salvation is real, and we are really saved and really destined for glory. And the way this relates to doctrinal questions that may not rise to the same level of certainty is that the profound experience of God-given spiritual sight and confidence and joy concerning the central reality of our salvation will enable us to peacefully, joyfully leave in God's hands all the unanswered questions that remain. Thank you, Pastor John, and uh, thanks for joining us today. If you have a question to ask Pastor John, find a link to email us and find our complete episode archive at askpastorjohn.com. Every episode with audio and full transcripts available for you free of charge. And if you want a digest of episodes in summary form to get a flavor of just how often suffering comes up for us in the podcast, uh, see my little digest in the Ask Pastor John book on pages 365 to 394. Suffering comes in so many different forms in God's Word, and our glorious Savior is relevant to each and every one of those situations. And I think you can see that bear out over the 12 years or so we've been doing this podcast. I am Tony Ranke. Pastor John and I will see you on Thursday. Thanks for listening.